Well, good morning. It is great to see you here this morning on this first day of 2023, believe it or not. But it is great to be in God's house. So glad that you are here with us this morning. We're going to start off this morning a little bit different than normal. We're still going to greet each other. But what I want you to do is before you even stand up, I want you to look around the sanctuary. I'm going to guess here that not everybody knows everybody. There may be somebody here that you do not know. If there is somebody that you do not know this morning, that's the person I want you to go to first and welcome this morning. So find that person that you don't know. Now stand up and go greet them. Welcome them into the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to Sunlight.
Scripture says we love Him because He first loved us. Amen? Amen. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Scripture states, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And we praise God for his word this morning to us and for this very powerful reminder, the start of a new year, that we can have new life in him and in him alone. So as we continue to worship him together this morning, as we prepare for a time of prayer here in just a moment, and as the worship team leads us, the altars are going to be open. Um, and we encourage you, if you want to start the new year at the altar, just maybe looking back, thanking God for His faithfulness in your life, or maybe it's looking ahead, thanking Him in advance for the ways in which He's going to be faithful in this coming year. Or maybe you have a prayer request, maybe you have a need, maybe you have a petition that's heavy on your heart this morning. Um, now's the time that we encourage you uh, to bring those requests and petitions to the altar. I would ask that you be in prayer for a couple individuals from our church family this morning. Please be in prayer for Crew Kaufman. Uh, Crew has uh, been dealing with uh, a uh, yeah, bad case of sickness this last week, and uh, the doctors are concerned about him. So keep Crew in your prayers for God's healing touch over him. Um, also be in prayer for Misty Rogers. Continue to be in prayer for Misty. Uh, she continues to be on the vent as she battles pneumonia. I uh, spoke with Janet this morning. She said that the, the doctors are hopeful uh, for her. She is improving, but keep her, keep her in your prayers. Keep Misty in your prayers in these days for God's healing touch over her as well. So the altars are open. Let's worship the Lord together this morning.
join us in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the reality as we, as we start a new year, as a new year dawns, that, that you're here and God, you're with us. And God, we know that you're always with us, but uh, God, I don't know about everybody else here, but I know I, I need those reminders. God, uh, those moments when when you step in and step through and just reveal yourself clearly. And uh, God, this morning we, we just pray for that. God, that uh, at the start of a new year, God, uh, not one of us can uh, go into this new year without you. We need you. And so this morning for each one of us, as you move in this place, as you search our hearts, God, you know. God, for those gathered at the altars, for those in the pews, for those joining us online, God, uh, God, you know the needs. And so, God, we pray that you would uh, meet us in, in ways that only you can, in, in big ways, and unexpected ways. God, for those that need a healing touch, and God, we think of crew, we think of Misty, we think of others, God. God, we think of those recovering from recent surgeries. God, we think of those, God, uh, dealing with various health-related issues and concerns. We think of those, God, at the start of a new year that are looking for direction, that are looking for purpose, that are looking for hope. And God, we know that we can find all that in you. So God, this morning, God, we pray, God, that today would be the day, God, that we start the new year off right and we take those steps. And God, we thank you for the salvation and grace that we have from you that, that comes so freely from you, but that only comes in you and nowhere else and in no one else. So this morning, God, as you continue to move in this place, as you have your way, we pray that you would guide us, strengthen us, encourage us, empower us, God, as we go out the rest of this day and the rest of this week. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence here. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. sure you picked up a bulletin when you came in this morning. I would encourage you to take that out now and go ahead and tear off that back flap. That allows you to, that was kind of cool, wasn't it? Uh, mark your attendance here with us this morning. Also allows us to partner with you, to connect with you in prayer. We've got a whole team of folks that pray over these requests each and every week. Um, so I encourage you to complete that and then you can just leave that in the pew when you exit the sanctuary this morning. Or you can deposit one of the boxes in the back next to each one of the exit doors, however you choose to do that. But I want to encourage you to take a moment and complete that. And then the bulletin is chock full of information about events, activities, things coming up in the life of the church in the weeks ahead. So I um, encourage you to be aware of what's going on. Um, we're very grateful as a church for your faithful and generous support in the ministries of the church. Uh, this is the time in the service that we would traditionally collect the tithes and offerings. And while we don't pass the plate anymore, we do have boxes set up in the back next to each one of the exit doors. So whether it's during this next worship song or at the conclusion of the worship service this morning, we encourage you to deposit your tithes and offerings in those boxes. Many of you take advantage of the electronic, of the automatic giving option, and for that we are very grateful. Uh, and if you're interested in taking part in that as we start a new year, uh, there's information in the bulletin there about that as well. Um, it does simplify the process immensely. So um, however you choose to do that, we're grateful as a church for your faithful and generous support as we start a new year excited and expectant for the ways that God's going to be coming through in big ways and unexpected ways. Uh, if you're worshiping with us for the very first time, we're so very glad you're here. Here at Sunlight Wesleyan, we're about loving people to Jesus. So if we haven't yet connected with you, we want to do that. So um, make sure you see Sarah in the foyer before you leave this morning. We've got a gift for you, and we'd love to connect with you in that way as well. Uh, let me pray now over the tithes and offerings before we go any further this morning. Lord Jesus, we're grateful. We're grateful for your presence here with us. We're grateful for the ways in which you provide and you guide and you strengthen and you are at work. And God, we are just grateful that we can be a part of that even in a small way. So God, we pray your blessing this morning over the gift, over the giver. God, that you would multiply the gift. God, that you would bless it. And God, empower us, God, as, as a church as individuals and as families to be good stewards, God, of all that you've blessed us with, especially at the start of this new year. So, God, we thank you in advance for the ways in which you're going to come through and the ways in which you've already come through. And we thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We pray all these things this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Did you feel that? Something just happened that many of us take for granted. Another year is officially in the past. A chapter is closed. And now we look ahead to a new year. The mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities of the past give way to hope, excitement, and joy for the new life God gives us. Pursuing Christ with each new dawn. Through His grace, we get the chance to reset the clock, to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. As we work, play, rest, and worship, we know His mercies are new every morning. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, arriving at next year's end through His faithfulness. So whatever we do this year, let's give it to God seeking His will, trusting His plan, and taking this opportunity to restart. Well, good morning. It is great to see you here this morning, and congratulations, you've made it another year. It's January 1st, 2023. How many of you thought you'd never see the year 2023? We're here. You made it. Rejoice. Be glad. It is a great day. It is a great day to be here. And it's, it's a brand new year. It's a brand new year of possibilities. A year of possibilities. A year full of opportunities. 12 months. 52 weeks. 365 days. 8,760 hours. 525,600 minutes and 31,536,000 seconds. What in the world are you going to do with all of that time? Many of us are determined this morning, especially on this, on this New Year's Day, to, to do things differently. We have, a, have good intentions to work hard at change. Some want to lose weight. Some want to exercise more. Some want to be a better person. Some want to make amends for wrongs in their life. Some want to, those bad habits that they have, they want to stop those because that tends to bring us down. Some want to start good habits that build us up. And some want to stop avoiding God's word and instead get into it. And I'm sure you've noticed that almost every year, major newspapers, magazines, internet post predictions, they all come up with, with what they think is going to take place in the new year. Some even go far, so far as to make predictions for years down the road. In the past, a few of those predictions have proven amazingly accurate, while others couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, back in the late 60s, a time when some of you weren't even born yet, the so-called experts predicted that by the turn of the century, technology would have taken over so much of our work that the average person would only work 22 hours a week. Not 40 hours, just 22 hours a week. They also predicted that we would work only 27 of the 52 weeks in a year. Wouldn't that be something? But I don't know about you, but that prediction certainly missed its mark. We had to go to work, get up and go to work every day. We may have complained, but we we're also blessed to have a job. In fact, nowadays, most of us are very, 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 very busy. We're always in a hurry. We walk fast. We talk fast. We text and tweet fast. We eat fast. After we eat, we stand up and say, excuse me, I, I got to run. That's us. That's the society we live in, a society in a hurry. So here we are on the first Sunday of 2023. And I wonder what we'll do this new year. Will we be as busy as we were last year? Will we make any better use of our time this year? In 365 days when the 2023 year is over, will we be looking back at it with joy Will we be looking back at it with regret? Will we be looking at the future with anticipation? Will we be looking at the future with dread? 
Will we have done anything different? Will we have gotten to know God any better? In Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, it says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, when many people read that verse, they realize that if their desire is to be wise and to make the most of opportunities in our evil world, then they have to follow the Lord's will. But what if you don't know what God's will? What if you don't know what that will is? Or, or what if you don't know where to find it? Years ago, a man hired an experienced guide to lead him on a hike into the Swiss Alps, and after some hours of climbing, they came to a high mountain pass, and to the man's dismay, he saw that the path before them had almost been erased. I mean, what was he going to do? On the left was a sheer rock cliff, to his right, a precipice that dropped nearly a thousand feet. And looking down over that precipice, he began to feel his head growing a little faint, his knees beginning to buckle, and at that very moment, his guide shouted out to him, Don't look down or you're a dead man. Keep your eyes on me. And where I put my feet, put yours there as well. The man did as he was told, and soon they passed out of danger to safety. That's pretty good advice for the starting of a new year. No one knows what lies ahead of us. And sooner or later, we may find ourselves in a place where the way ahead will almost seem impossible. And when that happens, we can panic and fall or we can fix our eyes on Jesus and mark carefully his steps before us. And if we will follow him and seek his will, we'll find at the end of this year that we have been kept safe by following his will in our lives. So how do we find his will? Well, I want to share with you this morning a passage of scripture that bothers me, and yet it has, tremendous it has a tremendous message for us as we try to figure out what God's will is. The passage is a part of seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. It's actually in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I would encourage you to turn there. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you forgot your Bible this morning, please use one of the pew Bibles, your electronic device, or you can follow along the screen this morning. But this is what it says in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now occasionally over the years I have gotten calls from someone who desires counseling that does not attend this church and they, they don't want to go to their pastor for whatever reason or another so they'll call and say can I come in and talk to you. Well a situation occurred like this with a pastor years ago and he retold this story. He said a lady that I'd never seen before came into my office she said, Preacher, you're, not go you're going to be shocked by my story. And then he assured her that he wouldn't because after 25 years of counseling, he had heard almost everything. So she began, I hate my husband. I hate the way he looks. He's gotten fat. He doesn't take care of himself. I hate the way he sounds. He slurps his food and chews with his mouth open. I hate the way he brushes his teeth. He gulps the water in his mouth and swishes it out and then spits it in the sink. He snores at night and makes all kinds of noises when he blows his nose. I just, I, just, I just don't love him anymore. And she went on with a long list of other reasons why she hated her husband. 
The preacher listened to this and he was shocked. I mean, he had heard this before, but never quite as bluntly as she was putting it that day. And usually after any kind of an unhappy tirade, he always asks the question, has it always been this way? Often there's a moment of silence and he can almost hear the wheels turning as people think back over their lives. And as she thought it over, there came a slight glimmer in her eyes, a trace of a smile on her face. And she said, no, it hasn't always been this way. He used to be kind and gentle and sensitive. I can remember when we were dating and how romantic he was. I remember intimate conversations and soft music and candlelight. I remember a wonderful wedding and honeymoon. I remember those early years of struggling together when we were having children and trying to find enough money to pay bills. There were some good times. There was a time when we were very much in love. Now, when we hear that story, it causes us to wonder, doesn't it? What happened? What happened in that relationship? I mean, the couple had been married for 20 years. What happened in 20 years to change love to hate and to make someone say, I hate my husband or I hate my wife? Yet that was a situation, love disintegrating, love evaporating and going away. I enjoy seeing newlyweds or couples in general who haven't lost the sparkle in their eyes for each other or the trace of a smile on their lips when they still wondrously and hopelessly are still in love with each other. There's something refreshing about that. But it's extremely difficult when you see the other side, when love begins to disintegrate. And our modern society tells us that we ought to be happy. And if you're not happy, then walk away from whatever it is that's making you unhappy. So there are thousands of people walking away from marriages because they're not as happy as they think they ought to be. And the same could be said about our jobs. Most of us begin with high, de high ideals about our work and our career and our future. And we, we begin with great enthusiasm and vigor. I mean, George Washington Carver held a peanut in his hand and looked up to God and said, God, what's in a peanut? And Carver said, God answered him, you've got a brain, figure it out yourself. So Carver started searching for all the possibilities in this lowly peanut. He fell in love with his work and gave his life to it, and all of our lives are the better for it. There's something tremendously fulfilling in doing something and experiencing the satisfaction of doing it well. But there is another side, isn't there? That when work begins to become monotonous, just something you do to get a paycheck and the feeling of satisfaction is gone. But the saddest example of loss to love is when an individual loses his or her love for God. And that is why this passage in Revelation is so tragic. It describes a church that was once alive and enthusiastic about the things of God. And we have spoken many times about the church representing the people that make up that church. So as we speak about losing our first love, it speaks to us and to us as individuals. So what happened? They had lost their first love. A long time ago, a few people met in Ephesus. They had heard the Apostle Paul and had accepted Jesus as their Savior. And they were very much a minority in Ephesus at that time. But the church there started with them. And they met together in homes. They read God's word daily together and they prayed daily. And they went out into their neighborhoods and among their friends and shared their faith with others. And soon more people had accepted Christ and their numbers grew. They were concerned about missions, they were concerned about shepherding, they were concerned about fellowship, and they were, they were known as an exciting, loving, and dynamic body of believers. They encouraged each other and built each other up in their faith. Then as the years passed, it is hard to determine why or when, but, but somehow, sometime along the way, they lost their fervor and their excitement. Maybe it wasn't anything they decided to do. It was something that just happened. And their love for God lost its edge, its glow, and its excitement. 
A man wrote about a church in his hometown. He said that it had always been there. He used to ride by it on his bicycle when he was a kid. He said that he never really noticed it at all that much except its sign was always there announcing the name of the church and the time of its services. He said that every time he drove by, even when he became an adult, he never gave it a second thought. He had never gone inside the church building, but it had always just been there. Until one day he drove by and discovered that the sign was gone. And in its place was a sign for a clinic. A group of chiropractors had bought the property and started a clinic in the old church building. And the man wondered aloud, why? What happened? There was, once was a time when kids came there all dressed up in their Sunday best. They must have had been times when people gathered and prayed and praised God and the church building was full. Great sermons were preached, hearts were touched, but now it's a chiropractic clinic. What happened? Probably not some scandal. I mean, the preacher hadn't run off with his secretary or absconded with all the church funds. If that had happened, it would have made the headlines in the paper. But what happened was more than likely just a subtle thing where people who used to pray stopped praying, where people who used to give stopped giving where people who used to witness stopped witnessing, where people who used to read stopped reading. And just gradually, a little bit at a time, the church died. And unfortunately, this is a trend that seems to be happening in far too many towns today. And that is why this verse in Revelation concerns me. But this verse also encourages me because it takes the rebuke that was given to the church and takes it a step further. To paraphrase the end of this passage, it says, see what is happening and do something about it. Well, what can be done about it? Have you ever noticed that when love is alive and exciting, it's always described as something warm or hot or passionate? But on the other hand, when love begins to fade, it's described as cold. And Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter 24. He mentions the destruction of Jerusalem, the persecution of Christians. And he warns them in chapter 24, verses 12 through 13. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. David writes in Psalm 51, 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That verse tells us, first of all, that there ought to be joy in salvation. When you're saved from your sin, the result ought to be joy. When we read the accounts of conversions in the book of Acts, we find that the people went on their way rejoicing after they had repented and been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. There was joy over and over again. The result was joy. But that verse also tells us that that joy can be lost. As it says, restore my joy. In other words, I've lost it. And I need to get it back. And this verse also teaches that restoring that joy is possible. This is why this letter was written to say, put on the brakes before it's too late. Stop before you have lost your love. And here is what you need to do. Verse 5 from our Revelation passage says this. Consider how far you have fallen. Now, other translations will use the word remember. We need to remember. Remember that we were once lost and dying in our sin, but God reached down and, and reached to us and, and met with us. We need to remember that. He says, remember when you became a Christian. Remember the excitement and the fervor that gripped your heart when love was new and fresh. You remember that. Remember the wonder of the grace and mercy of God that was upon you. Remember the treasure it held for you. Hold it warm and glowing in your heart. Never forget 
what God has done for you. Consider how far you have fallen. And then he says, after you remember, then repent and do the things you did at first. That's a strong word, repent. We find it over and over again in both the Old and New Testament. The prophets consistently cried out to the nation of Israel, repent, repent. John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus began his ministry, one of the first words in his sermon was also repent. And there is a need for people to repent, to change, to turn around, to start a a different kind of life. And we can repent of two things. You repent, first of all, of the sins that you have committed. Pride, selfishness, greed, immorality, whatever it might be that you're involved in. You repent of those. You give them over to God and ask for forgiveness and say, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. But also, and this is what I tend to believe happened in Ephesus. The reason they received that letter. There was a need to repent of the things that they should have done but just did not do. The sins of omission. Have you ever made a recipe that you made it many times before and it always tasted great? But there's the one time that you were busy and you were making it and you forgot an ingredient and it tasted terrible? The church in Ephesus had been a strong and vibrant for so long, but then something changed. They fell out of love with God and things went wrong. They began forgetting ingredients that were vital to their relationship with God. What was once so good and vibrant was now failing. In this letter to the church in Ephesus, we've mentioned many times before, the letter was sent to Ephesus, but we've made many, mentioned many times before that the people are the ones who make up the church. The church itself The church itself did not lose its love. They did not lose their first love. The people of the church lost their first love. The people had forgotten what ingredients they needed to have as a part of their life. And they had lost their way. And they needed to find their way back. So what is this passage What does this message have to do with us today? One of the things that I am seeing within the church today is that there are people who are losing their first love because they're not spending the time that God expects God wants in his word. So on this first Sunday of 2023, I want to challenge each of us to find our way back to our first love. Because you cannot fully love God until you know who he is. And one of the best ways to know who God is and to know his will is by being in his word on a daily basis. I do not know how many of you read scripture or how often you read scripture, but I know that some of you read through the Bible each year. And I don't think you do that because you have to, but because you want to. You seek to know God better, and by spending time with him each day, your love for him continues to grow. And my desire in this challenge is that each one of us is not to say that we did it. It's not an assignment. It's not like going to school and the teacher says, I want you to finish this by the end of the year. It's not an assignment. This is something that I believe we need to do if we are going to get our first love back, and we're going to be where God wants us to be. My desire is that this challenge is that as we go through this, that our love for God will grow each and every day. And as our love grows, the love of the body will grow. And when we come to December 31st of 2023, when we'll be able to look back upon the year and say, I know God better this year than I have known him in the years past because I've spent each day with him. I've spent time in the word with him each day. 
in your bulletin this morning, go ahead and grab it. In your bulletin this morning, you're going to find a daily reading schedule. So that by the end of 2023, you will have read through the entire Bible. Now, this particular reading schedule is a chronological schedule, which means that you will be reading about events in the Bible in the order in which they happen, which means that you may do a little more reading, jumping from one chapter to another. You may read something in Genesis, and then it may take you to 1 Chronicles and then back. And the reason it does that, because what you read about in 1 Chronicles also took place in Genesis. So it helps you to realize what took place. It's not just a bunch of jumbled things, but it takes place in the order of which it happened. And I I know some of you already have your own reading schedule, and if you do, you can continue to use that, or you can change to this reading schedule. And throughout the year, I'm going to ask 12 different people, at least 12 different people, to write a little devotional about what they have read in that month and place it in the bulletin so that we can all be together as we're going. Something to read about in the month and keep us on the same page. Now, I also want to tell you that as you start reading this, my guess is that it will start like it usually did. You'll say, okay, I'm going to do that. And you'll start out for the first week, week and a half. You'll be reading every day and then something happens and you stop reading. If that happens, I want to tell you right now, do not go back to where you stopped. Start the day new, whatever day that was, you start reading again. Because if you go back and try to catch up, it's not going to happen. Just start fresh on that new day. I also want you to know that this schedule came from Walk Through the Bible and the, the website. If you'd like to do this, you can use this. You can have copies made of this, or you can go to the website and get one of your own. You can also do, put an app on your phone. It will bring it up on your phone. The address for that is www.walk. W-A-L-K-T-H-R-U dot org. If you want to do that on your own, you can do this. Because I realize that for some of you, what I'm asking you to do, you've never done before. And there are a hundred different reasons why you cannot do this. For some of you, you've glanced at the schedule already and you've already decided that you don't have the time or there's too much reading and you're not a reader. For some of you, you might be saying, I don't have a Bible, so I can't do that. For some of you, you might be saying, I have a Bible, but I don't understand it. I need a different translation. I'm asking you to please, please, please do not allow Satan to place excuses in your life that will keep you from reading God's word. Because that's exactly what he's going to do. He's already started it. Some of you pick this up and say, I don't have the time to do that. That's Satan putting an excuse in your mind to keep you away from God's word. What I'm saying is you need to pray in God's name. Lord, help me to overcome what Satan is trying to put in my mind right now. If you're not a reader or you don't think you have time, Allow us to help you as a staff to find a podcast or to help you find an audio Bible that it can read it to you if you don't have time to read or you're not a reader. When you're traveling or something like that, you could have it being played in your car, an app on your phone that will do the very same thing. Help us to be, let us allow us to help you to get past that excuse that Satan gives you. If you have a Bible that, that, If you don't have a Bible, let us know, and we will get you one free. We'll get you a Bible that's free. If you're saying, I don't have, I have a Bible, but I don't understand the translation, then let us help you find a translation that does make sense to you so that you can read this. Getting into God's word is so important for us so that our love for him will continue to grow. You and I, if we do not get back to our first love, if we do not pour ourselves into scripture, if we are not reading scripture daily, then what is happening is the same thing that happened to the church in Ephesus. The things we should be doing, we're not doing. And the things that we're not doing are taking us further away from God than we ever intended to go. 
Because I know what you say. Well, I'm, I'm not going to read today because I'm too busy. I'll read tomorrow. You know what happens? Tomorrow never comes. And what we were planning on doing doesn't get done. The Revelation passage concerns me in that if we are not careful, if we are not careful, we will be sent the same letter that the church in Ephesus was. We must keep our first love. And that means that you're going to have to make some choices. Is your first love Jesus or is your first love something else? You have to decide that. I can't do it for you. I can't make you read. All I can do is tell you what Scripture says and wants us to do and give you the tools to be able to do that. And that's our desire. As Pastor Lane and I have talked and the staff has talked about this, it is our desire that this church, all of us as individuals that make up this church, will return to our first love and by getting into the word of God and reading it and get to know him and make him first in our life. That's what we've got to do. The church in Ephesus received a letter. It says, these things, yet this I hold against you. But even though that was held against them, it gave them the opportunity to turn around and go back, repent, and do the things that you did at first. If you were like me when I first accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, I was so excited. I wanted to be involved in everything. I wanted to, I wanted to get to know Christ. And then what happens is Satan comes up against you and starts taking you further and further away from where you want to be. You cannot allow Satan to take this away from you. You have to be in his word. And it's our desire to help you to be able to do that. Will you stand with me, please? Lord, by hearing this word and reading this letter that was sent to the church in Ephesus, we realize, Lord, that it is a warning for us. Because the church of today can do the exact same thing that the church of Ephesus did. And Lord, by seeing that warning, we also realize that you are giving us hope. You're saying that we can turn things around. We don't have to go that way. We can turn around. And Lord, that is what I pray that we will decide to do today. Is that we will turn around. And we will go back to the things that we did at first our desire is to make you our first love and our only love Lord and a way to do that is to make sure that we are in your word and growing daily and so Lord I pray right now over this congregation those who may be reading and listening from home Lord I pray for them that you will come upon them right now And that you will instill with inside of them the desire to get into your word. That you will take away all the excuses that Satan is going to try to put in our way. And you just get rid of them. And instead, Lord, you give us the encouragement. You give us the desire. You give us the drive to be in your word on a daily basis. And Lord, I know that as we do that, and I know as we continue to grow, that Lord, you will continue to pour out your blessings manifold blessings and Lord we just come to you right now just asking that you will guide and direct us we've been given a a new chapter today and a new year January 1st we start off today a new year is before us and in that new year Lord we can make changes in our life and I pray that the changes that we make will draw us closer into our relationship with you And by the end of the year, we'll be able to say, I know the Lord more intimately this year than I ever have before. So Lord, help us to do that. I ask for your blessing to be upon each and every person, that Lord, that you will already instill within sight of us a desire and a drive to be closer and closer to you. 
And Lord, we ask all of these things in your name. So I ask that you would release us with your benediction and your blessing. That Lord, that you would travel with us throughout the week. And Lord, that we would hit the ground running as we re put ourselves into scripture this year and read through this Bible in the year. And Lord, we look forward to the blessings and the words that come from your people in the year to come. And we ask these things in your name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless. If you have any questions about the reading schedule or anything, please do not hesitate to let us know and allow us to help you to follow through with this. God bless. Happy New Year to all.